Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, good morning and welcome to Nairobi. It's called the Green City in the Sun. Welcome to Kenya and welcome to the Africa Climate Summit. I have welcomed you to this great city on behalf of the people and government of Kenya on this, to this meeting that is co-hosted by the Africa Union and the government of Kenya. Uh, let me give you a bit of uh, information that uh, will make it easy to find your way around. Um, Nairobi is a very interesting city. On one side, there's a full canopy forest. And on the other side, we have a wildlife national park. Um, we keep the wildlife in the park because we have a fence. But sometimes, as nature would, uh, would be, uh, they break away from the fence. So while you are doing your morning walk, you might encounter a lion. Please be careful. <laughs> it is not uh, tamed. It is wild. Let me also... Um, inform you that Nairobi is the home of the United Nations Environmental Program, the only UN agency headquarters in the Global South. So <laughs> discussing matters environment, you are in the correct city. And if you need any referencing, the UNEP is right here. Let me also volunteer some additional information that um, Kenya, a few kilometers from where you are seated, scientists, including myself as a scientist, discovered and located the very early, the earliest remains of man on earth. In other words, this is where humanity began. Before you guys went all over the place, in Europe and America and Asia and the rest of our continent, this is where we all began. And therefore, allow me to welcome you home. And in a few months, we are having a conversation as Kenyans. In a few months, we are seriously considering abolishing any visa requirement because it is unfair to ask anybody coming home for visa. I welcome all the delegates who responded positively to Africa's call to gather at this inaugural Africa Summit. In order for us to imagine, design, and then build a future of prosperity for Africa and the world, you have just stepped into, uh, let me take that again, you have not just stepped into a conference hall. You have entered the future, a future ripe with potential driven by global partnerships committed to African prosperity, inclusive growth, and a livable planet for all of us. Clearly, therefore, this is no ordinary summit. We are not here just to talk about Africa 
or climate change in the usual way, which often accentuates our divisions. You all remember the North versus South, developed versus developing, polluters versus victims, and the whole of that uh, conversation. And even within our own government, sometimes we have conversations around economic development, so badly needed for us to achieve stable and dignified livelihoods, and is often cast as a trade-off with environmental stewardship as if they are mutually exclusive, when in actual fact they are positively reinforcing. Let me be clear, these conversations are necessary. Africa's carbon footprint remains small. But the human toll of climate change is disproportionately high. The urgency to address loss and damage and to configure appropriate financial mechanism for resilience grows with each extreme weather event and each bout of climate-induced insecurity. A complex interplay of needs and responsibilities is a daily challenge, but it should not lead to a deadlock. We must be alert to the fact that they can sometimes blind us to the bigger picture. Delivering prosperity and well-being for Africa's growing population without pushing the world deeper into climate disaster is not just an abstract proposition or a mere wishful thinking. It is a real possibility proven by science and affirmed by emerging experience. An opportunity-oriented focus on climate action is the engine for propelling Africa into a, a realm of stability and prosperity, elevating us to middle income status and beyond. This context is precisely what sets this climate summit apart from others. It aims to unite us across neighborhoods, across sectors, across institutions, local or international, across country borders, across continents, and across generations. It is because we all have a shared stake in the Earth's ability to sustain life that we must envision together a future that embraces the values of equality, human security, and shared prosperity. Africa possesses all the necessary conditions to realize this future. Our foremost asset is our young and growing young people and workforce, educated, skilled, and motivated to pursue industry, innovation, and enterprise. And we saw them here speak ably this morning. And I congratulate the young people who've been here for the last three days, and they have done a tremendous job in the Youth Summit. We have ample renewable energy potential as well, and the natural assets and resources to green our own consumption, but also to meaningfully contribute to decarbonization of the global economy. We must see in green growth not just a climate imperative, but also a fountain of multi-billion dollar economic opportunities that Africa and the world is primed to capitalize. We are brought together by a clear understanding and deep concern about the inadequacy of our present means in terms of institutions and available finances to deal effectively with the magnitude of our collective threat 
and challenges. But we will not shy away from the difficult conversations and uncomfortable realities that must be addressed to achieve meaningful change. Policy, regulations, taxation, trade, and climate justice will all be scrutinized in national, regional, global contexts. Yet, the way we frame these discussions matters. I invite all of us to adopt opportunity lens as we navigate these complex dialogues. For a very long time, we have looked at this as a problem. It is time we flipped and looked at it from the other side. There are opportunities, immense opportunities as well. And that is why we are not here to catalog grievances and list problems. We are here to scrutinize ideas, assess perspectives, so that we can unlock solutions. The very format of this summit has been designed to facilitate such engagement. Over the next three days, be ready to be challenged in this dynamic ecosystem of dialogue and discovery. African and global leaders, innovation trailblazers, experts, investors, and captains of industry are here to explore the opportunities, tackle the barriers, and scale up solutions. While I cannot encapsulate the breadth and depth of all our program within my opening remarks, allow me to outline the overarching theme, which is the unparalleled opportunity that climate action represents for Africa. As you are aware, the climate conversation began 31 years ago in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro. But this is the first African summit 31 years later. When my colleagues agreed in the African Union, that is, agreed to my offer to host this climate summit, it was clear to me that this inaugural summit is going to be the stepping stone to the ultimate resolution of this challenge. The reason why possibly we haven't made much progress is because Africa had not consolidated and assembled its ideas and brought them to the table. I am confident that now going forward, we have all what it takes to create a win-win outcome out of this very intense conversation about climate change. This occasion summons us to contemplate the full range of possibilities that can be unleashed by directing investment and appropriate technology to actualize our continent's abundant resource endowments. Let us look, for example, at food production and the protection and expansion of our invaluable natural carbon sinks, which stand at the intersection of our environment and ecology on one end and economic opportunities on the other end. Since 1961, Africa has witnessed a one-third reduction in agricultural productivity due to climate change, a stark reminder of the urgent need for adaptation. Yet, much of the world is just waking up to the merits of restorative agriculture, a practice that already resonates with African farmer farming practices. By building on the wealth of indigenous knowledge, we can scale 
enhance and even monetize our agricultural systems. This enables us to unlock the huge potential in our agricultural land assets representing two-thirds of the world's uncultivated, underutilized, um, arable land to feed our growing populations and to do so in harmony with our invaluable natural carbon sinks. Additionally, the restoration and expansion of Africa's natural carbon sinks are just are not just an environmental imperative, in fact. They are an unparalleled economic gold mine. They have the potential to absorb millions of tons of CO2 annually, which should translate into billions of dollars if we were living in a fair world, improve livelihoods and millions of opportunities across this continent. And I was having a conversation yesterday about a banker of one of the big multinational banks. And he was telling me about Africa's GDP. And GDP is about assets. It's about what you have. We have the carbon sinks that serves the world, cleans our environment, um, acts as sequestration of carbon that is produced by others. But we get nothing for it. It's not anywhere in our balance sheet. Everybody's assets are in their balance sheet. Some of ours are not in that balance sheet. The day we put our whole assets in our balance sheet, you will know that we are a very wealthy continent. And let me say, we do all that, but it doesn't count for much. But we do it anyway, because we love this world, because it's our home. And that is why the conversation of North versus South must come to an end. Who did what? It's not a conversation that we have the luxury to engage in. Because when the apocalypse happens, it will happen for all of us, for the entire humanity. Let me say this. We do this and all of this comes while safeguarding our, bi our biodiversity. We are careful to make sure that that is in place. Our renewable energy resources are just, are, or are not just environmental necessity. They are the ultimate catalyst of radical socio-economic prosperity. They can fuel sustainable development, drive economic growth, create jobs, and also uplift millions from energy poverty, all while reducing our carbon footprint, continentally and globally. The possibilities are not just promising, they are transformative. Africa can power all our energy needs with renewable resources. The continent has enough potential to be entirely self-sufficient with the mixture of wind, solar, geothermal, sustainable biomass, and hydropower. In Africa, we can be a green industrial hub that helps other regions achieve their net zero strategies by 2050. In other words, this is what I'm saying is Unlocking the renewable resources that we have in our continent is not only good for Africa, it is good for the rest of the world. Because we not only are driving our own growth, 
but we are ready to share these resources with the rest of the world and by doing so we will assist the rest of the world in ensuring that we move towards the net zero target that we all set for ourselves. And for Africa renewable resources, it is not just the volume, but also the non-seasonality of our renewable energy that stands out. The, near, the nearly year-round sunshine makes Africa's solar potential particularly unique, perfectly suited to industrial energy demands, something that is challenging in other areas, especially in temperate climates. Kenya, for example, serves as a good example of what is possible. Our national grid currently operates at three gigawatts with 93% of that power being renewable. Our ambition is audacious yet achievable. 100% renewable by 2030 and a 100 gigawatt grid entirely renewable by 2040. A serious challenge in bridging the investment gap in order to enable the continent meet its energy needs is the creation of demand on sufficient scale to provide incentives for appropriate private investment in energy infrastructure development. Industrial energy at scale is therefore necessary to anchor energy demand as a means of tackling the widespread energy poverty still prevalent across our continent. The numbers are stark. Nearly 600 million Africans lack access to electricity. Another 150 million grapple with unreliable power, and almost a billion have no access to clean cooking energy. But the abundance of our renewable resources, the possibilities offered by new technologies, and opportunities created by new climate financing offers enormous possibilities for us. We have the capability to provide reliable and cost-effective energy access to all Africans by 2030. The green transformation of both production and consumption is not optional. It is an imperative. The global demand for such solution is already gaining momentum. Our strategic proximity to substantial reserves of metal and minerals necessary for the global energy transition makes Africa an attractive candidate to become a global hub in green industrial supply chain from refining metals and minerals to constructing and assembling electric motor vehicles, batteries, and other components. Let me invite you to this unprecedented geoeconomic opportunity for Africa. We are already key players in the extraction of these minerals, but much of the higher value addition, smelting, refining, assembly, and even the production of electric motor vehicles happens elsewhere. Let's put some numbers to add perspective to what I'm saying. By 2025, the mining of battery critical minerals, nickel, lithium, cobalt, is estimated to generate some $11 billion in value. If we, however, if we take the next step and engage in value-added activities like refining, these minerals into industrial grade metals, that value could quadruple to $50 billion. And if we consider the end-to-end -end value chain for electric vehicles, including the battery pack and all other components, 
the market value skyrockets to an astonishing $7 trillion. That is a trajectory. What today we are selling for $11 billion could be $7 trillion if we engage in the right trajectory. And that is what we are saying. And that is what Madam Josepha was saying. What these figures clearly demonstrate is that Africa can no longer afford a minimalist, short-termist, raw material-based approach. The time has come for us to break out of the shackles of low ambition. We must now begin to aim higher and strive for more and better outcomes. As we work towards capturing more economic value from these opportunities, we are not just building a resilient and prosperous continent. We are also contributing to a more balanced and stable global economy. It is the only way, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to stop the migration using rickety boats from one continent to another. It is the way that we, we are going to stop the negativities. We need to balance our development, and we have the assets to do it, and we have the ambition to do it, and we want to do it together. Trillions of dollars globally are looking for green investment opportunities as the pressure to tackle climate change and crisis heightens. Africa holds the key to accelerating decarbonization of the global economy. It is a statement of fact. Africa holds the key to decarbonizing the global economy, whether it is industrialization, whether it's manufacturing. We are not just a continent rich in resources. We are a powerhouse of untapped potential, eager to engage and fairly compete in the global marketplace. <clears throat> Consider this. Every year, Africa needs to generate approximately 30 million jobs, new jobs for that matter, to accommodate its rapidly expanding workforce. These are not just numbers. They are not just statistics. These are 30 million opportunities to build our future, 30 million dreams that can be fulfilled through climate-proof avenues of growth, and 30 million steps towards shared prosperity. The examples I have shared with you are not mere statistics. They are pragmatic routes for Africa to not only participate in the global economy, but to excel and to grow. I accept that it is one thing to say what is possible, and entirely another to make it happen. For example, infrastructure is expensive. It needs finance and finely tuned policies to attract investors. It needs technical know-how and agile institutions. A major concern that we all know and we all appreciate is cost of capital in Africa. Acting as a most prohibitive barrier to our progress. Private investors charge high premiums driven by both real but mostly perceived risks. It is not a secret that we are paying at least five times as much as advanced economies to borrow from the financial market. It's a fact documented. Like many of us, a few years ago, I would have believed the challenges were too great and the barriers too high. Today, I see them differently as mere tests of our collective will and ingenuity. We should develop effective policies and regulations that catalyze investment and entrepreneurship and unleash 
the creativity of local business. We must transform Africa's resource wealth from mere potential into real opportunities by directing large-scale investments that will actualize the possibilities that exist and await our citizens in present and in future generations. Let's make no mistake, however, we have no choice but to approach this colossal task with clear minds and open eyes. A lot needs to happen before Africa can live up to its full potential of providing climate solutions for its citizens and to the entire world. Over the next few days, I have no doubt that African leaders seated here and our friends from elsewhere will be open, honest, and direct about what we can commit and bring to the table and, what the, and the, the type of the collaborations we need from our global partners. My call to everyone present in this historic summit is for us to work together and converge our efforts on African priorities. I urge everyone to make a contribution to our generation's unprecedented and highly consequential endeavor to catalyze climate action in a spirit of candor, collaboration, and courage. Let us imagine a pathway for different financial structures that can deliver on Africa's goals. Let us commit to invest in viable solutions presented by renewable energy, green industrialization, climate smart agriculture, and nature conservation. I am confident that we are all inspired by the possibilities before us and galvanized by the demands of this critical time to engage productively, collaborate successfully, and conclude the Africa Summit with a Nairobi declaration on green growth and climate finance agenda that will commit us to pursue a climate positive path to propel Africa's economy and promote job creation in a manner that limits our emissions and aids global decarbonization efforts. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends, this summit is a moment to imagine a bold and radically affirmative African future. We are here to envision a continent that links markets and connects resources with demand, unlocking massive economies of scale, a continent that offers an economic backbone for a decarbonized world, a continent that thrives and shapes climate-proof future for all. So, as we immerse ourselves into the array of complex issues during the summit, let us fix our gaze firmly upon the horizon of possibilities. The future is not just something to hope for, neither is it something to merely wish or wait for. The future is for us to conceptualize and actualize starting now. That is what we have come to do at the Africa Climate Summit. Welcome to the future, and I thank you.